Annie, welcome to Washington Times Higher Ground. Really exciting to talk with you today. Let's start with the book. The book is so happy to know you. What motivated this project? Yeah, thank you so much for having me. I'm so glad to be here with you. Um, you know, I, I don't know if you know this part of my story, but I used to teach elementary school. And I taught two years of fifth grade and three years of fourth grade. And one of my dreams when I switched to this career of being an author, a podcaster, a speaker, was I, I still wanted to serve kids that I taught. And I still wanted, I, I taught in public school and, and it mattered a lot to me to still be able to speak into their lives. And so when I started writing kids books, that was kind of the dream of like, can I write kids books that can sit in a public school classroom and anywhere else, but still kind of have a, a gospel thread to them. And so happy to know you is this, this story of what would it, how different would we be? How would we feel differently if we actually believe that God made us on purpose? That the way we were made is who we were meant to be and that the the most unique things about us are the best things about us. And, and so that's really where it came from was wanting to serve kids and remind them that who they are is who God meant them to be. That I love that. Well, first of all, now I have five other questions because- Okay, great. Teaching. Okay. So what, yeah. what was it that motivated you getting it? My wife is a, is a, actually a public school elementary school teacher. So I'm yeah. always interested to know what was it that drove you into that line of work initially? Uh, my third grade teacher. My third grade teacher, Miss Albers, was just incredible. And ever since third grade, all the way through college, I thought the only thing I want to be is her. I just want to have a classroom like Miss Albers did. And so that's what I did. I mean, I, I'm, I'm not kidding you, Billy. I never strayed once when I was going through my growing up years of how I wanted to spend my life. And, um, and so then I got to do it for five years. I just absolutely loved it. I, I think it's so challenging and beautiful and such a gift to get to speak into kids' lives and families' lives. No, absolutely. And I want to I want to get back to the book because I think I, there's so much to unpack there about just culture and how this is a great topic for where we are right now. Um, but but so you end up obviously on this journey of doing what you do now. You're you're writing best selling books. You have an amazing podcast network. You have a great show. Um, what was it that kind of shifted you in that in that direction? Because it's very different from public school teaching. It is and it isn't because if I really dialed down like why I think God made me and so in, in the stream of so happy to know you in the stream of like what makes you different is what makes you great. Um, I really have got one gifting. I can entertain people until they learn something. That was true when they were in fourth grade. That is true in the books that I write. That's true on stages. That's true in podcasts. That's true in friendship. And, and so what I grew to understand is like, okay, God has made me this way. There's this unique thing about me. One of the main ways he invited me to like express that was in a public school classroom and, and teaching and helping them learn the water cycle by bringing in my guitar and making up a song about the water cycle. And I actually still do the same thing. I still entertain people until they learn something. Um, it does look really different, right? My hours are different. My days are different. My summers, sadly, are very different. Um, but, it, it, but in a lot of ways, I am still doing the, the thing I am uniquely made to do. Yeah. And, and so you have obviously so happy to know you, your latest book, this, this kid's book. What I love about books like this is they offer something to everybody, right? The kids are getting something out of it, but also the parents. And I think that's so important. You know, I have two young kids, you're reading them books, you're sharing with them and being able to kind of enjoy it alongside with them. It feels like that's something you really accomplished with this particular project. When you're, when you're going into a kid's project, are you thinking about how the parent is going to respond to that content as well? Yeah, totally. Because I think everything that we take in as grownups is, is affecting our whole history, right? So whatever I am reading, whatever I'm watching, little five-year-old Annie that is still in me is also reading and watching. And, and so there are a lot of ways that what I'm trying to write, I'm thinking, man, I want to write for these kids, but I'm thinking about the teachers and the parents and the Girl Scout leaders and the swim team coaches and all the people who are reading alongside. I mean, the funniest, well, funny, it is funny to me. The funniest thing has been parents reaching out to me and going, well, I wish you'd have told me to read this once before I read it with my kids so I wouldn't cry. You know? And so like, <laughs> there is just this like, man, we all want to know that 
that the thing that can make us feel the most separate is actually one of the things that's most important about us. And the thing that makes us really unique is really important. And so don't grownups need to hear that too. I need to hear that too. So I'm writing it for me as much as I'm writing it for my friends that are five, six, eight, ten 10 years old. Yeah, it's it's so interesting because it feels like the culture is so divided. It doesn't feel. I mean, we are divided. Yeah. People hate each other. They're yelling. They're fighting. And there's so much, um, you know, even our differences, not being able to tolerate differences, right? Like yeah. when I grew up, it was, if I disagree with you, okay, we disagree, but we could still be friends. That's yeah. really kind of gone out the window. And yet you have this generation of young people growing up watching the adults act kind of crazy, right? Not able to interact with each other. How can a book like this, I mean, these are very real subjects, right? Of worth yeah. and and the fact that you matter. How can it help really all of us sort of navigate that and maybe use it as a tool to help our kids navigate that? Yeah. You know what? I had a funny experience last night where someone left a comment on one of my Instagram posts and, and said, I'm overly dramatic. And I was like, well, listen, I've been accused of way worse than being overly dramatic. <laughs> so that's great. And I thought, yeah, okay. Your experience of me is that based on your feelings, your history, your story, that's how you're responding to me. And so there's a version of me that would have gone, no, I'm not. No, I'm not. You don't know me. I am, you know, I'm great, blah, blah, blah. And instead I got to go, I bet I totally see that your story has led you here. And that is why you feel that about me. I totally get it. Good. God, God be with you. Go. You don't have to follow me, right? <laughs> I say all that to say that what we get to model for kids is how we respond to people who are different than us. I think often, and kind of how I grew up and what I was taught was like, let's pay a lot of attention to how we're different and bring it out so that we can talk about it. And I, I sometimes wonder if maybe the healthier way is just experiencing other people and paying attention to how we respond to them versus pointing it out. And so even in, in kids' books and TV shows and all these, we get to sit with kids and see what they notice. My nephew is three. And when he was describing, he was with his friends in his class and they are all sorts of different backgrounds, all sorts of different races and all sorts of different families they come from. And when he's describing them to me, he was telling me the color of their shirts as if I knew who wore a red shirt to school today. But he doesn't remember their names yet, but he's like the little boy in the red shirt, the girl in the green shirt. And I thought, man, that's it, right? Like, like there are really beautiful things we can see about each other and we can call out in each other that makes us unique. And, and I will always think of that one little boy in the red shirt, right? Because that's how my nephew yeah. described him. And so I just wonder if there's a little bit of that in us as adults where we can start like finding other ways to see each other. And besides our political leanings, like what color shirt we're wearing seems like an easier, more beautiful way to call each other out and to see each other. Yeah. Yeah. And and to be able to say, you know, I mean, look, I, where I live in, in New York, just outside of New York city, most people around me don't agree with me on almost anything. Right. But yeah. if I didn't befriend them or get along with them or right. love them, which I do, I would have no friends or family. And so, right. you know, so, I mean, you, you make a choice and in, in how, and, and I think as Christians, right. And this is important for everybody. If we're going to lead as Christians, well, the way that we interact with people, everybody, not just people we disagree with, but even our enemies, it really matters. And I think we've we've sometimes forgotten that in the chaos of this culture, we kind of get swept up in that too. I know, I know I have. And so it's it's important we I think pull back and reflect on that. Yeah, I think so too. And and just having this um lead with love thing of like, yeah, it, it, it if it doesn't feel like love to the person you're loving, you need to really think about that, especially strangers, especially people who don't agree with you. What? How can we love them in a way that they actually feel that? And, and so that's, I mean, things like kids' books, not even, I mean, all sorts of kids' books are such a beautiful way to put in front of our children, like, look, everyone on this page is someone that you could be friends with right? So what do you see on this page? What do we see on this page? What can we talk about? And it's why it matters to me that we put a lot of diversity. We have a little kid in all of my picture books that has a hearing aid. And we have a little girl with glasses. And we have a little boy in a wheelchair. Because I, I want not only to represent different families, different um, skin tones, different types of hair, but like kids who have all sorts of varied abilities. So we can go like, yeah, that kid could be your friend too. That kid could be your friend. That could be you, you know? And so how do we teach to love first? I mean, we're trying to figure it out too, right, Billy? I'm trying to figure it out. Yeah, You're trying yeah. to figure it out. Like, But at yeah. least you and I, something I think that is true about our generation is we are coming awake to 
that our, um, our decisions not laced in love are having a massive cultural effect. And so yeah. we got to figure out how to bring love back into it. No, absolutely. I mean, a lot of what we're fighting about now, some of it is because maybe things haven't been handled well, and now you have to figure out how do you come back, handle it well, and say, you yeah. know, we don't have to all agree, but we can find a place to love one another and and move forward in some kind of healthy yeah. way as opposed yeah. to, you know, what we kind of have going on right now. You know, yeah. it's interesting. One thing I don't know a lot about, because you you brought up, obviously, when you're telling a story like this, when you're putting a book out, you in this case, I guess let's start here because you're putting this in maybe public schools or it's yeah. not just going into churches or Christian schools. What is that process like to sort of storytell in a way that you know, hey, this is, it's going to have a gospel thread, but it's going to be done in a way that anybody could read it. It could be in those public schools. Yeah. Well, a couple of things. Thank God I have training in it, right? Like th that I spent five years in a public school classroom, but also was trained and read a gazillion kids books. I'm sure this is true about your wife. When we <laughs> yes. go through college and I mean, part of it is every week they want you to write a different lesson plan around a, a picture book. So I've read a bazillion of them. That helped. Um, also, as we're writing it, I'm paying attention to the grade level appropriateness. And I, we are putting it in front of librarians and teachers and saying to them, is there anything in here that would keep you from carrying this? We put it in front of the National Library Association, uh, Librarian Association, and just made sure, is there anything in here that, and, and in my first kid's book, um, What Sounds Fun to You, there were a couple, we talk about a place of worship. And there was a little pushback of like, I don't know if we can have this. And I went, okay, well, I still feel like that's what's right for the book. But I understand that it won't be in every public school classroom or library. Um, but with this one, we pretty much resoundingly got to like, man, this fits our, this fits who we are. This fits what we can do in school. And, and then my hope, Billy, that, that we call it sneaky Jesus around here, right? Where we get to write things that have threads of gospel in them. So I get to write these books that have, particularly for kids that have a thread of gospel in it. And then they take it home and the parent goes, let's see if this author's written anything else. And then they Google me and they see that we have a whole podcast called Let's Read the Gospels, where I'm reading Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John every month this year, right? So, so hopefully that. books like this are a doorway that opens. And, and then the parents and the kids go, oh, this author has a lot of resources that could tell us directly about Jesus. Yeah, I mean, there's such a debate right now. My kids go to public school um, and there's such a debate and we won't even get into this debate right now, but about whether or not Christians should have their kids in public schools. And yeah. my view right now on, on the whole is having projects like this, having things that are present, you have a presence there. And like you're saying, people can go, my kid, my 11 year old loves to, to follow authors. Like, oh, this yeah. author, just like you were saying, what else do they have? And that is such a great way for people to discover the other things that you're doing. I, I absolutely love that just, you know, we could pull back and not have a presence, but how does that help anybody? I mean, it doesn't right. bring the gospel to anybody then in any yeah. way. So I, um, I important. dedicated this book to the kids that I taught the five classrooms, the fifth graders and the fourth graders. Well, I was 22 when I taught them. I'm 43 now they were 10, they're 33. Right. So, so they are just having their own kids and growing up. And so I got on Facebook, Billy, and I, I started looking for them because I wanted to send all of them copies and just go like, hey, I, I don't know if you remember me. I was your fourth grade teacher, but I wrote this book and, and dedicated it to you. And I got to mail of my 120 students I taught, 130 students, we mailed about 70 books to wow. kids that I taught. And, and I, it's the same thing, right? Like when I, I could get teary telling you about it. When I taught them, I honored the separation of church and state. I, I was a Christian teaching in a public school. I'd like to say I had a Christian classroom because of how we ran it, but I, I, was, I was a faith person, but I abided by what I had agreed to. Now I get to hand them books and, and say to them, hey, I don't know if you remember me, which everybody remembers their elementary school teacher, right? But I don't know if you remember me, but here's what I write. And there's a lot more that I've written if you want to go read it. And so these prayers that I prayed for these fourth and fifth graders 20 years ago, God's answering now. Wow. Are you hearing stories from, from them? I mean, are they reaching back out to you now that you've yes. been able to send these? It's been oh, wow. so sweet. I mean, they're like, I read this to my daughter. I mean, one one girl sent me 
Um, one girl, she's a woman now, but you know, she was a fifth grader to me. Her and her five kids sitting across the, uh, down the couch, she's reading it to him. Multiple students have said that it brought tears to their eyes, just remembering our time together and that I would think to send it to them. And it's just been really, really special. And my hope is it is the resurgence of a relationship where I can be really forward about who I am as a faith person in a way that I was uh, respectfully not doing 20 years ago when I was their public school teacher. Yeah, and this and this is where those seeds are planted. Had you not been their public school teacher, and this is where I pull back from that debate of people saying we just need to abandon the public schools. I agree. There's a lot of chaos going on in some yeah. public schools, not all of them. But but abandoning the public schools, I mean, I don't know. Like you're sending these books out now, you're changing their lives potentially, yeah. right? By having yeah. that presence. So what a cool full circle story. Isn't that sweet. Oh, I just cried on my couch when I when I started seeing them posting pictures of it and sharing and saying, my four fourth grade teacher wrote a book. My fifth grade teacher wrote a book and look, it's dedicated to me. And oh, it just, it, it was, it's been really moving. It's been a really special part of this book that I didn't predict experiencing. You know, one other thing about you that I find so interesting is that you're known for fun and, you know, the way that you approach your interviews, the way you interact, you know, you're just, you're very personal and people love that. That's why you've done so well in your podcast and your network and, and with your books. Um, you also tackle things, you, know, you tackle lighthearted things. You also tackle heavy topics. Is that ever difficult for you? Because, you know, it, it, it can be challenging. You're, you're diving into topics that could get people fired up sometimes, but yeah. you're passionate about them and you go into it. So what, what is that like for you? Yeah. I mean, rewind and tell Annie 10 years ago when she's naming a podcast, that sounds fun, that there's like some other options <laughs> that might be worth thinking through. Um, no, I, I, you're right. It's one of the, it's an interesting thing. I think because I've done the, that sounds fun podcast for as long as I've done it, people have grown to expect a variety, but it also is, it is an interesting thing to lead with fun, but also to be like, man, we need to talk about toxicity in the church. And we need to talk about like, how are you doing in your dating life? And are you being healthy in your dating life? And, and how do we talk about a, a, an abuse of power? I mean, it, it, it is hard. It's even hard for me to know how to balance that really well. And so, you know, I, you just ask God to be with you in it. And, and I, it is the fullness of who I am. Like I, I need to show up even in our podcast studio, I need to be allowed to show up fully me. And fully me is really fun. And I want to talk about going to Dollywood and I want to talk about my fifth graders getting the book. And then I also want to talk about the, when God doesn't answer your prayers, what do you do? And, mm -hmm. and so hitting, hitting all those things is kind of the roller coaster being friends with me, Billy, unfortunately. <laughs> Well, I like that though, but that, I mean, that's the variety. I mean, I deal in that variety too. So I, I tend to like that. I, I think it's fun to have yeah. lighthearted conversations and it's important to have the serious ones. And, you know, you deal with the reaction that people are going to have when they have it to it, but it's, it's, uh, it's important. You know, before we go, I do want to ask you um, just about, and, and I know here's like the heaviest, heaviest question right. at the end, you, you know, your faith journey, because I don't know, you know, did you grow up in the church? Did you come into it? That's something yeah. I don't, I don't know about you. Yeah, I, I grew up, it, my parents took us to church our whole lives. I, I really made the choice to follow Jesus um, when I was five years old. And I really clearly remember it. I like to joke that the Lord was like, y'all, we got to get her before she's 16. <laughs> like, it's just not, <laughs> let's go ahead, let, get her in here. I don't have the time. And so, um, it, and so I really grew up as in the 90s as part of that youth group was important to me. If the church doors were open, I was there. I, I really loved God and I meant it. Uh, when I went to college is when I kind of had that moment that I think a lot of people do who grow yeah. up in the faith of like, am I doing this for me or am I doing this for my parents? Like there are like, kind of I had this moment of like, there are other options. I don't have to do, I don't have to go to church. And so I had, I had about a year of college where I really asked those questions of, do I want to do this? Is this who I want to be? And and I thank God that it is. And it, it Jesus proved himself as true as he always was and always is. Um, but yeah, it's been my whole, it's really been my whole life with a lot of ups and downs and bumps and bruises, but I'm very thankful to have one of them. Um, you know, a lot of people complain about having boring testimonies and having, you know, like, Oh, I don't have anything to really tell. I'm like, man, I, I've, I have enough pain to tell, but enough of a boring testimony to be grateful to. 
Yeah, well, and I think it's always a good mix, right? Even the ones that feel boring. I grew up in the church too. It's like, there's a lot to tell. You think sometimes your story is yeah. boring when it's really not, right? There's there's yeah, a lot right. there. There's that's a lot right. there. And you've done amazing things, you know, with, with your career and what you do. And the book is so happy to know you. Annie, appreciate your time today. Thank you, Billy. I'm so grateful for what you do. Thanks for having me on.